Guys, the biggest hack in all of crypto's history just took place last week. Over $600 million was taken from the Poly Network project. This is a major saga that unfolded over several days and it's taken some time for all these details to come together. But now that, you know, everything's kind of settled down, I want to make this video to actually break it down so that you can understand, you know, step by step in a simplified way. And I'm going to answer a lot of the frequently asked questions about this. Like, hey, what does this mean for DeFi going forward? You know, what's going to happen? I'm going to talk about all this as a blockchain developer who works this technology on a daily basis. So before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory. And on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to become a blockchain master step by step from start to finish, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's look at the details of what actually happened here. So let's start off with what Poly Network is in the first place. So it is a cross chain exchange. So what does that mean? Well, one of the biggest things that's made DeFi or decentralized finance so popular is that you can trade uh, tokens directly on the blockchain itself without having to register for a cryptocurrency exchange website. So think about a popular app like Uniswap, for example. You can just go to Uniswap's website if you have a blockchain wallet installed and start creating cryptocurrency instantly that way. You don't even have to go through the KYC process, okay? But one limitation of the Uniswap uh, application is you're limited to the cryptocurrencies that exist on top of the Ethereum network. So if you want to trade on Uniswap, you can only trade Ether and then other cryptocurrencies, ERC-20 tokens that run on top of the Ethereum network. Let's say you wanted to trade Ether for Bitcoin, for example. Those are two different blockchains. And in most cases, you'd have to use a website like Coinbase.com and go through that KYC process that most people are trying to avoid inside of decentralized finance or DeFi to protect their identity. Okay. So that's where Poly Network comes into play. It's actually a solution for trading cryptocurrencies between different blockchains. So let's say you wanted to trade uh, two tokens or two cryptocurrencies that don't run on the same blockchain. Well, this is a solution for that. So how does it work? Well, essentially, in order for this to uh, exist, both blockchains have to talk to one another. And just natively, blockchains are their own ecosystems. They don't natively talk to one another. So you have to build some sort of technology that sits in the middle. Most commonly, this is a bridge technology where essentially you can move cryptocurrency from one blockchain to another. And how these typically work is you take cryptocurrency from one ecosystem and you send it to a smart contract on that ecosystem and then some sort of computer process sits in the middle okay that lets the other blockchain know about the state of the previous blockchain notably that cryptocurrency has been sent to this uh you know smart contract address that it exists inside of there and now it's safe to release the cryptocurrency on the other blockchain so that's the whole idea if you're going to swap you know uh cryptocurrency a to cryptocurrency B on a different exchange, whenever that swap happens, it's going to lock up the funds on one blockchain and give them to you on this other blockchain. Okay. And there's some technology that sits in the middle uh, that makes this possible. So in the case of Poly Network, they have something called a uh, keeper. Okay. So a keeper is really just a, a server process that talks to smart contracts in each blockchain that listens to messages on each different chain to know when these transactions happen to say, hey, you know, we've received money on this first blockchain and we're going to, you know, release it on this other blockchain to actually facilitate that exchange. And this is actually the vulnerable, uh, you know, weak link where the exploit happened. So now uh, I'm going to explain what these keepers are and how they are exploited. And I'm going to use a couple different tweet threads here to assist in this. OK, so this is one from uh, Miko here um, and another one from let's see here. This is from Kelvin. So I'll put links to these down in the description below. So these are great tweet threads. Uh, so full credit to these guys for helping explain this stuff. So here's what the hacker is able to do. So going back to these keepers here, how the Poly Network worked uh, is there are four different keepers, okay? So these are four different processes that all communicate between these different blockchains. And the attacker in this case was able to replace all four keepers with themselves. Like basically this, this computer process that's supposed to be able to transfer funds when exchanges and potentially arbitrarily move funds. That's what the hacker was able to do. They were able to control that and therefore control the funds themselves. So how did they do it? Well, there was a logic fault inside the design itself. So basically inside the computer process and also inside the smart contracts that are linked to each keeper. Because again, there's this computer process, but then there's this contract that actually facilitates the exchange and the storing of funds uh, between each blockchain. So basically, the hacker is able to craft specially signed cross-chain messages that calls the smart contract on a different blockchain on the other side, and they were able to call the smart contract themselves. 
So basically, he's able to act on one blockchain and sign messages that would go to the other chain and basically pretend to be the keeper in this case. And so basically, the contract design had a logic fault that if it's called by the keeper, it can actually rotate the keys and add and remove other keepers. So essentially, if the contract knows about a whitelisted uh, set of addresses that are there for the keepers, then one of these keepers can essentially remove other keepers, okay, and then replace themselves. This is one of the most common uh, patterns when you're talking about you know, permissions and software development. You don't want somebody with special per permissions to be able to remove other permissions. It'd be like if you had an admin website or an, a website where you could select admin users, you don't want other admins to go in there and remove the other admins and then they control the whole website. That looks like what happened in this case. After the hacker was able to get sophisticated access to spoof being this keeper. So he's saying the smart contract design did not account for the scenario for the smart contract to be able to call itself. So the attacker triggered a message from the ontology side of the bridge to the Ethereum side of the bridge, and the message called the keeper smart contract and the message called the solidity function to re reset the keepers. So after becoming the keeper, the attacker moved all of the tokens to himself and herself that were keeper locked in Ethereum, essentially making their wrapped tokens on ontology worthless. And there was nothing backing them up anymore. And after that, things just got absolutely crazy. I mean, the hacker started sending messages on the Ethereum blockchain where you can create transactions that actually have encoded input data. And when you look on Etherscan, you could actually decode these if you change the input down here and you can see like chat messages in the Ethereum transactions. So you've got people actually communicating with the attacker, like telling him what to do with the funds. You got the hacker communicating back. You have a flood of people, uh, you know, coming in, sending, you know, just spamming the attacker with transactions saying, hey, give me some of this money. It was just an absolute mess. They started moving funds from one blockchain to another, spreading things around. He started just giving money away. And then things, you know, started to take a turn where the hacker indicated they were just going to return some of the money, you know, sending some messages indicating this on the blockchain. Um, at that point, it seems like it's a case where people started actually verifying the identity of the hacker because that's a pretty big misconception in DeFi is that like, nothing's traceable. Well, a vast majority of people are going to be able to get tracked down. In this case, we had a, you know, security team come in and actually identify device fingerprint information for the attacker and other, you know, identifying data that basically figured out who they were. And the latest update on this is that they're working on recovering the funds right now. All right, so that's an overview of what happened with this particular exploit. Now, I want to talk about some frequently asked questions that always come up whenever these happen, because this is not the first attack, you know, for DeFi or on the Ethereum you know, ecosystem or any other blockchain for that matter. So the first one is, you know, is this game over for decentralized finance or DeFi? All right. So the quick answer on that is absolutely not. You know, DeFi is still really early. It's still really experimental. And I try to make it clear to everyone who's watching this channel like this is amazing world changing technology, but it's still early and you need to exercise caution whenever you use this. But that being said, we've had major exploits happen in the past. Multiple exploits happened in 2020 and 2021. Yeah, they started off with the famous DAO hack on top of the Ethereum network, which actually caused the Ethereum classic chain to fork from the main Ethereum chain that we know and use today. And multiple have happened ever since. And every single time people keep continuing to use the network, that's because the long term benefits outweigh these short term setbacks, even despite this being the largest cryptocurrency hack for DeFi or any blockchain to my knowledge to date. And the other big point here is that these hacks or exploits, you know, make DeFi stronger in the long run. So I know people like take issue on the calling this a hack versus an exploit. I typically just use the word hacks because people understand what that means. So anytime a vulnerability is exposed in these DeFi systems, we have the opportunity to you know, take a step back and actually learn from it. Okay. And at the end of the day, a lot of these vulnerabilities really won't be exposed until they are out there in production. Now, some, you know, projects are sloppy and they move fast without audits because, you know, they just want to do it and make money fast. I always recommend people get security audits. Slowing down and doing things right is the best solution for everybody and for the long term. But even after you go through the process of rigorous auditing, at the end of the day, we really don't know what we don't know. And those things really won't get exposed until you get out into a production environment. Okay, so here's why. Well, basically, if you go back to my uh, diagram here, you know, looking at, um, you know, this, this keeper design. So this keeper is something that's going to hold, you know, millions and millions of dollars of cryptocurrency, in this case, $600 million. Now, this is a giant honeypot for hackers to come in and try to, you know, steal the funds. So if you're going through traditional auditing, basically, you have to hire somebody to try to find a vulnerability in this system. And you can incentivize them to do that. So you can pay them maybe a high hourly rate to do it. Maybe you could pay them a bounty based on the severity of the bug that they find. 
And, but typically, the upside for this type of you know honest white hat person is the, the upside is nowhere near as big as it is for a production uh, attacker to come in and do this. That's what the actual incentive is. Okay, in this case, let's say even you had a security auditor and you're like, hey, I'll pay you a million dollars if you find a vulnerability in this because it's going to save us a lot of money in the long run. Sure, that's an awesome incentive, but these hackers are sitting here saying, well, I could make $600 million or some percentage of $600 million if I find, you know, a, a bug and actually exploit it in production. All right. And maybe I can negotiate with the people after the fact to, you know, settle with, with a smaller amount and, and make out way more than I could if I was an honest, you know, white hat security hacker. I, I'm not saying this is right. I'm not saying I'm advocating for people to exploit things in production and steal money. It's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is it's human nature there's no really way around this other than just putting the applications out there and seeing what happens. And the best compromise in the short term is basically saying, hey, users who are going to participate in this, you have to understand the risks. All right. Don't put in anything more than you can lose until we have these projects that have stood the test of time. And we can take these learnings and iterate on them and make them better. And so typically when these things happen, they're for newer, you know, riskier projects. We have other projects that have gone through this extensive auditing process. You know, that have stood the test of time without any major exploits. I mean, look at any of the DeFi apps that launched in 2019 that are some of you know, the leaders in the space today. A lot of them have survived for quite a long time without any major exploits like this. Which leads to the last question that a lot of people ask about these particular incidences, which is, are these you know inside jobs? Right? This is a common uh, theory, especially from these smaller projects is, hey, Either one, it was a developer on the team who realized, you know, had some privileged knowledge and realized how they could exploit a system and then they see the upside and they're like, hey, I'm just going to peace out, you know, and, and do this. All right. And then go, you know, maybe they flee, whatever it is. Or maybe you have... Maybe it's like a low-key scam or essentially you have this project that's, you know, posing as, you know, this great DeFi solution, but their actual exit strategy is to get exploited and like take funds. So, I mean, I don't have enough information to confidently say one way or the other about these types of things in any particular incidents. I don't have a strong indication to think that's what happened here, but these are some of the alternative, you know, theories that a lot of people, you know, think about. All right. So that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already that really helps these videos out so the more people can learn about blockchain you know if you're as fascinated with this technology as i am you want to get your hands dirty how can you get started today well you go to my youtube homepage you find my free courses there they like you to be courses but they're totally free and if you like those and you want to take the next step or hey maybe you want to take a massive shortcut entirely i can show you become a blockchain master step by step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash boot camp you don't have to be an expert to get started today i've helped people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months so that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching DAP University.